And good morning once again, options traders. Well, how accurate is that volatility estimate? This is a really good question for the group. And if you're new to volatility and at least learning to look at volatility, this is critically important. So a lot of traders, when they look at, especially with the historic volatility, and they say, well, it's an actual calculation from my broker's platform. And therefore, this is the volatility of the stock. Well, is that necessarily true? Is there some wiggle room? And if so, how should we compare this to implied volatility? And if you're not aware of this, there's a very good chance you're going to make really bad decisions between the implied volatility of an option and the stock's historic volatility. So the thing that I want you to get from this video is to understand when you look at a volatility estimate that there is some variation around that and you need to take that into account. So let's go have a closer look. How accurate is your volatility estimate? So before we get started, as always, please be sure to click like. It's really helping. It would go a long way in promoting the channel. So for volatility, the thing to understand is that it's not really possible to know the true volatility of a stock. That sounds kind of weird, but the reality is you only get estimates. There's a couple of key reasons. First is that the samples, which is what they are, we're just getting samples of estimates, they're only over short time frames, usually a 30-day estimate on most brokerage platforms. But even more important is that market conditions change. See, in the stock market, it's not like we're getting dealt samples from a deck of cards where that variation never changes. We could get really good estimates on the variation there. But that's not true for the stock market. It's always changing. So that complicates things even further. All right, so that's the first thing is that we're going to take samples over short periods of time, but then we're also having changing market conditions. But all estimates are subject to what are called sampling errors. So what does this mean? It means, well, when you're taking a sample, we're looking at a 30-day sample of hundreds or years and years worth of trading of this stock. And we're trying to figure out what is the volatility of the stock. So again, you can see that it depends on the time frame that we're talking about. And whatever time frame that we go and we grab this sample of stock prices, we're not always going to get the same average. We're not going to get the same standard deviation. And that's just because there's room for variation. So this is really a statistical concept. Don't worry too much about the math because the concept is actually quite easy. So what is sampling error? Well, let's do a simple example where we are going to flip coins. So regardless of how many times we flip it, you would expect to get 50% heads by flipping coins. Or you could say 50% tails, same thing, but we're just going to focus on the heads. All right, so we would expect to get 50%, but there will be variation around this number. It's not always going to be exactly 50%. So how much variation should we expect? Well, as you can imagine, there is a mathematical formula. Don't worry about the formula, but I'm going to show it to you here so you can see how these calculations are being done. The percent variation is in statistics. This is actually called sigma, but it's the standard deviation. And we're going to divide that by the square root of n, which just means the number of samples that we're taking. So the standard deviation in trading terms is volatility. So we're actually looking at our volatility number that we get dividing by the square root of n. So back to our coin flipping example here, the standard deviation over 100 flips is actually 0.25. And that's actually found by taking the 50% probability for heads, multiplying by the 50% probability for tails. We get 0.25. That would be the standard deviation. But we're going to divide it by the square root of n. So let's say that we did this 100 times. We're going to flip this coin 100 times. Square root of 100 is, of course, 10. So what this does is it gives us one standard deviation, which as I've talked about before, covers about 68% of the area under a bell curve. So if you take 0.25 divided by 10, you get 0.025. So what this is telling you is that even though we would expect 50%, we could be plus or minus 2.5% 68% of the time. What if we wanted to look at two standard deviations? Well, that's easy. We just multiply this number, one standard deviation, by two, we get 0.05.
So now again, we're saying, yes, 50% is my expectation, but it could be plus or minus 5%. So if we subtract 5% from 50% and we add 5%, we get a range somewhere between 45 to 55%, 95% of the time. Because remember, two standard deviations makes up 95% of the area. So again, we would expect to get 45 to 55% heads, but not all of the time. 95% of the time this will be true. So could we get 57 or 60? Sure. Could we get 70? Yes, you could. Probably have to sit there for a long time to get it, but it's possible. Anything is possible, theoretically speaking, outside of these ranges, and they're going to happen 5% of the time. So that's another key point, is that whenever you're even considering ranges, realize that that does not mean 100% of the time. So let's go see this in action. Let's go over to an Excel spreadsheet and take a look at this example. Okay, so over into the Excel spreadsheet, what we've done here is I've got 100 rows, and we're going to do a simulated coin flip. Let Excel flip some imaginary coins, and one is heads and zero is tails. And then up here, we're going to count the number of heads, the number of tails, and we're going to figure out the percentage of heads. Now, in the previous slide, we said it should be plus or minus five percentage points, so somewhere between 45 and 55 percent. And if that's true, if we fall into this 45 to 55 percent range, it's going to shade this box in green. So if we did several attempts at flipping a coin 100 times, we should see that 95% of the time that this box is going to be green. It's going to be plus or minus 5 percentage points. But that doesn't mean all of the time. Sometimes it's going to be red. All right, so let's try some. Let's go ahead and do another trial. There we got 54%, but still within the 45 to 55% range. Try it again. Got exactly 50 47, 54, 49, 53, getting a lot of it. Oh, there's one that's 42. So that's about three percentage points below the 45 mark. But again, don't think that that's impossible. It's just going to happen 5% of the time. So again, a lot of traders would look at this and say, well, if you flipped a coin 100 times, it would be nearly impossible to get 42% heads. Well, that's just simply not true. That's still very much within the range of sampling error. Let's try it again. There's 43. There's 56. 51. Again, most of the time should be green. There's a 44. Now, if we sat here long enough, could we get a 40 or a 35? Sure, might have to sit here for a very long time, but they are all within the realm of possibilities if we sit here long enough. That's the whole idea of sampling errors. There's a 57. Let's see if we can get a really extreme one, see if we can break 60 here. There's a 40. There's a 60. So again, it doesn't mean that we can't be quite a bit away from 50% heads. Doesn't mean that there's something funny going on with the math. When people feel that, they just don't understand how much variation that there is. And this is with 100. As we're going to find out in the financial markets, we're usually looking at sample sizes of 30 days. And that's part of what I'm trying to show you here. So how quickly does it fall off? Well, this graph over here is showing various numbers of flips. Here's five flips, 10, 15, 20, and so on, all the way out to 500. That's what we're looking at over here is 500 flips. And right next to it is the two standard deviation mark, plus or minus 22 percentage points. That's what's going to happen on very small sample sizes. These ranges get really, really big. So if we come down here to 100, that's what we saw plus or minus 5%. But look how slowly it falls off. You know, we're still at plus or minus 3%. Way out here, still plus or minus 2%. It doesn't drop off that quickly once you're way out there. Where you get the quick drop-offs are in the early stages. So this red line is a graph of all of these numbers right here. So if we have a small sample size, you can see that as we increase it, we rapidly start to decrease this range, which is a good thing. We're getting tighter ranges. But once you start going further and further out, it starts to taper off very, very slowly. So there's a really big cost for more precision. But here again, right, there's 100 coin flips. There's our plus or minus 5%. So you're going to see this no matter what the thing is that we're measuring, whether it's stock volatility or coin flips or anything else, 
you will get a rapid drop off in the early stages and then it will start to taper off very slowly. So there's a big benefit for grabbing more data. But then there's also a problem with that in the financial markets. So the problem is, sure, we'd like to get more data to get better estimates. But going too far back in time means you're probably looking at irrelevant data. Can you imagine now if you're in early April of 2022 and you go back just a short time, you're going to start involving coronavirus. If you went back that far, you'd say, well, we would have better estimates. Well, not really, because you're talking about a period of time that was so vastly different. So that's the problem with trying to get better and better estimates in the stock market because the stock market is always changing. So again, it's not like going with coin flips or flips of a card because you're dealing with the same deck or the same two sides of a coin. See, that's not true for the stock market. Now, ideally, how could we get around this? Well, we would like to use higher frequency data. And I'm kind of surprised with today's computing power that we don't have firms that are doing this. So instead of just using close to close, why can't they go in there maybe in the afternoon and at the close or every hour or every 15 minutes? Where is the stock? Where is the stock now? Where is the stock now? Take all of these samples so that you're still within a 30 day window, but now you've got thousands of data points and that would be a much, much better assessment of the stock's volatility. But that's more of a side note. That's what we would really like to see. A short window, again, maybe 30 days, but lots and lots of data points. But what do we do today? Well, again, most reports use a 30 day close to close. We're only looking back 30 days. And if you can imagine the amount of variation we saw in a coin flip, you can only imagine how much there is in 30 days. So yes, it leaves a very wide range for sampling error. So for instance, let's say if you're in your E-Trade platform, Thinkorswim has a similar chart. And this blue line is the historic volatility. The orange is the implied volatility. Now, a lot of times traders will look at this and say, wow, the implied volatility is only 49 and a half. Let's call it 50 historics at about 70. So options are relatively cheap. We should be a buyer of options, possibly. What we really need to ask is, is this 70% number, is there enough variation in there to where we could say, you know what, it's actually possible that it could be in this 49.5% range. And that's something that you need to do as a trader. You need to ask, is this current implied volatility really this much lower than the historic? Or is it possible that this historic level, because of sampling error, could really be in a range around this 49.5%? In which case we would say maybe the options are just fairly valued. So how would we do that? Well, let's see how we would do it with NVIDIA. So again, the formula would be the standard deviation or the volatility divided by the square root of N. So in this case, we saw the historic volatility. I'm just going to call it 70% and it's a 30 day volatility. That chart was looking back 30 days, looking at the closing prices, coming up with a calculation of 70%. So let's take 70% divided by the square root of time, which gives us 13. That's one standard deviation. Two standard deviations is twice that or 26. So if we have a 70% estimate, we really need to say 70% plus or minus 26%. So the range could be somewhere around 44 to 96% could be the truth where the real historic volatility is. It's just because of sampling error that we ended up at 70%. But somewhere in this range, we would be 95% certain that the truth lies here. So now come back to our graph. Here's the 70% number that we're getting from our sample. But remember, it could be, the truth could be somewhere of around 44 to 96%. Well, 495 or 50% falls in this range. So you'd have to be really careful about saying that options are definitely cheaper relative to the historic volatility of the stock because we're only looking at a 30 day sample, it is quite possible that this 70% number is really as low as 44%. And this was just kind of an oddball estimate, just like we saw with the coin flips. It could be due just to sampling error. So if there's nothing else that you get from this video, you want to learn to think in ranges. A volatility reading 
isn't the only possibility. It's an estimate of a range of possibilities. So over a 30-day sample, a lot of variation can occur. And so now you have a way, for those of you who are somewhat comfortable with the math, who could actually go and do an interval and figure that out. And if you're not, at least realize that the historic volatility readings that you're seeing are not really etched in stone. They're a range, and you need to take that into account when you're setting up your strategies. And for anyone who'd like to learn more about the art and science of options trading, please check out the Alpha Trader course, Strategy Lab, and a technical analysis course. It's all at optionsa-z.com. Also, please join us on the YouTube channel, Options A to Z Facebook Trading Group, and you can find a link in the description below.